So I'm excited for what 2024 is all about. And we are currently in a series to figure out more about God, to learn more about him, because the more we know him, the more we love him. So let's pray and we'll jump right into the scriptures. Father, we honor you today and we just thank you. We could receive absolutely nothing from you and yet we are still complete in you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. And now we have this precious book, the very voice of God, the word of God. And we ask now, Father, as we open this up, that you would prepare our hearts, our minds, our souls to receive the word, not just from a preacher, but Holy Spirit, the revelation you want to bring to your children. So we put you first and we say, speak. Holy Spirit, you are the only spirit welcome here. Spirit of fear, go. Spirit of distraction, go. Holy Spirit, come. May you speak to our hearts. May you illuminate the scriptures to our eyes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Heard a story of a preacher who was a hunter, and he purchased himself a hunting dog, an eight-week-old little German pointer, short-haired pointer. And he remembers when he got this little eight-week-old puppy, he wanted to see the natural you know, instincts this dog had. So he takes a fishing pole and he puts a pheasant wing on the end of it and he dances it around the puppy. The puppy runs right up to it and does this. Then the puppy looks at the preacher and goes, I have no idea why I'm doing this. It's just a natural instinct. And as the puppy grew, uh, the, the pastor got a trainer to train him on how to hunt, how to point. And, and they went out into the field to go after the, you know, the game birds and so forth. And they did it several times. And the dog was just geared in for hunting. I mean, anytime there was a, a hint that something would go down for hunting, this dog had the zoomies like you wouldn't believe. Even the sight of a shotgun shell would send this dog crazy. So they went out several times and finally the pastor had the opportunity to take the dog by himself. So he gets there, unloads everything. He's ready for an awesome day of hunting. And the dog comes out of the kennel, goes right under the trailer and falls asleep. The dog could care less about hunting. So he had a lousy day of hunting because the dog just simply didn't want to participate. And he comes home and calls the trainer and says, what am I doing wrong? I mean, I, I, I've seen him do this over and over. And when I take him out without the trainer, all of a sudden he just wants to sleep on the job. And the trainer said, um, you didn't feed him before the hunt, did you? He goes, of course I did. I want him to have energy and stamina so he can hunt all day. He goes, no, 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 no. You never feed the dog before a hunt. You always hunt hungry. Always hunt hungry. And when I heard that, something rose inside of me that as believers, we are not called to idleness. We are not called to comfort. We are called to be hungry in the hunt. The very famous Psalm 23 says that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Isn't it interesting that God's provision is right there in the middle of a problem? It's not waiting after at the end of the problem, in the middle of the battlefield, in the presence of the enemies, we see a table that was laid before him. We are not called to luxury. We are called to be more than conquerors who advance his kingdom. So we're continuing today in the I Am series, studying the names of God. So far, we've looked at El Shaddai, God Almighty. We looked at Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. And today we are looking at Jehovah Jireh which means our provider. And the purpose, as I mentioned earlier, is that we want to just know more of God. It's just like dating somebody. The more you discover, the more you fall in love. The more you discover, the more you know how to minister to them in the way that they like, their love language, the way they like to be talked to, the type of gifts and hobbies that they're into. The more we know about God, the more we can love him. And Jehovah Jireh, this compound word, because God is so big, we can't just give him a single name. <laughs> we have to bring up these, these compound names that describe his attributes and describe his character. So Jehovah Jireh is broken down as Jehovah, which means Lord, and Jireh, which means provider or provides. But as I, I dove into this word in the original language, the Hebrew, I discovered that especially Strong's definition really doesn't define it so much as provider as much as it says several times, he sees or being able to see. So I'm like, okay, well, 
So many preachers talk about Jehovah Jireh, my provider. So many songs are about this, but if it's really broken down to he sees, is that really provision? And so I, I stumbled on Charles Spurgeon's sermon on Jehovah Jireh, and I love his take on it because he takes that original Hebrew and he says that Jehovah Jireh can be translated as the God who will see to it. The God who will see to it. I like that a whole lot more because Jehovah Jireh is like, yeah, here's a couple bucks. You know, here's, here's, here's what you need. Here you go. But the God who will see to it is the God who is faithful to perform all that he promises. That means that no matter the circumstance, if God promised it, he is faithful to fulfill it. So the purpose of the series, again, knowing God more, but I believe there's a temptation involved when we understand and learn more about the names of God. And I'm, I'm seeing this in every week as I'm studying, you know, where we saw El Shaddai, God Almighty. Yes, God, you're almighty. But then we turn on the news and the world is crazy. And we think, well, are you really almighty if, if the world is falling apart? Last week, we looked at El, uh, Jehovah Rapha and we looked at the God who heals. And the temptation is, but I'm still sick. The temptation is the world, people are still dying. So is he really healer? We, we have to wrestle with these. And so today, Jehovah Jireh, we get the opportunity to go past the temptation of, God, are you really my provider when I'm still in financial lack? Are you still my provider when I don't see these things coming together? Are you still my provider when I don't know how there's going to be a way? So we wrestle with these things and knowing more about God's nature can more convince us and bring us the faith that we need to hold on to truth and the world is absolutely crazy. <laughs> so today we want to look at Jehovah Jireh. In the first instance, we see it in the scriptures. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to Genesis chapter 22. We're going to read the first 14 verses of Genesis 22. And here we see that Abraham was given a promise. You are going to be the father of many nations. And he finally gets that promise with his son Isaac. And now he hears the word of the Lord that says, great, now after all these years, you're 100 years old, I finally bless you with what you needed, go kill it. It's the most absurd passage of scripture. But today, as we read these 14 verses, I see seven different phrases, seven different things that happen before God's provision actually comes. And I believe these seven things can encourage us today on how to keep a focus on the truth of who God is but also on how we can step further into God's provision. So if you're reading along with me, I'm in the New American Standard, verse one of Genesis 22. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And then it's funny how somehow God leads us and he won't tell us the outcome. We want a map and sometimes we get a Holy Spirit who's a tour guide. <laughs> you don't see the end, but I'm taking you with me. Verse three, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to the young man, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there. We will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. It's so interesting that Mount Moriah is actually the same mountain ridge that Golgotha is, the same place where Jesus himself was crucified. So here in Genesis 22, we see the only begotten son who is dearly loved, who is gonna become a sacrifice on a mountain, who has wood placed upon his back. It's just such a beautiful foreshadowing of Jesus and the Messiah of what is to come. Verse seven, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father says, here I am, my son, said, behold, the fire, the wood, but..." Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? So this shows me that Isaac is not a baby. He's not a helpless little thing that can't fight against his father. 
He can reasonably speak. And some scholars think that Isaac was actually around 17 years old. My six foot one son is 17 years old. And it's getting a little bit harder for me to keep beating him up nowadays. You know, he's getting a little strong on me. So I believe that Isaac was a willing participant. He said, okay, God spoke to you. This is what we're doing. I don't see the lamb, but I trust you because you trust the father and you know his word. And Abraham said, and here it is, God will provide. Jehovah is Jireh. He himself, for himself, the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. They came to the place which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. So Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, said, here I am. Said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the place, he named the place, he declared over that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the mount, the Lord will provide. This is beautiful. Here we have Abraham who has finally given after decades what God has promised him. He goes up to the mount to be obedient to God, not realizing that at the same time he's going up that mountain to sacrifice his only begotten son is the same time God had already sent a ram to go up to that exact place. We have no idea about a God who never sleeps or slumbers, a God who is always working, how he's already producing what you need and what you want in the authority that we have in Christ. So as I mentioned, there are seven different things, seven phrases in Genesis 22 that just leapt out at me that I believe if we put into practice, we would better see the provision of the Lord. The first one is the word tested. Abraham was tested in his loyalty. I heard a, a great quote this past week. Uh, it said, if you feel as if God is being silent, remember that teachers are always silent when there's a test. The teachers don't teach, the teachers don't say anything. When it's a test, it's a time for the student to learn and to grow. So we need to understand that testing of the Lord is not punishment. When you say I'm being tested, it's not a bad thing. When you are tested, don't look, as it, look at it as a punishment, look at it as an opportunity. If I'm being tested, there's something God wants to prove in me. If I'm being tested, I have the opportunity to evaluate what's going on in my heart. It's an opportunity, not a punishment. And out of all the seven things that Abraham did before the provision of the Lord came, number one was being tested. Number one, the first thing he went through was probably the hardest thing, and that was a test, to test him of his loyalty. And it made me wonder how many believers have trusted God for a promise for so many years, said, God, I'm believing for this, I'm believing for this, but we stop at step one. The moment it gets hard, the moment it gets rough, we give up and we don't pass the test, never getting to experience even the other elements of it. We give up when it gets too tough. Now, testing in the Bible is much more different than testing in our culture today. You know, it's kind of like a common phrase, like, don't test me. <laughs> you know, it's like, you better watch out for your bottom, young man, right now, because you're testing me. In fact, I was at Walmart, which is always a very entertaining place to be. I was at Walmart and I saw a t-shirt, this lady she had on. I'm not sure if it was from her church or where it was, but she says on the back of the shirt, I'm holy, but I'm from the hood. So pray with me, don't play with me. <laughs> it's definitely not biblical, but it was sure funny. <laughs> but testing today is different. Testing in our culture is like, don't aggregate me. Don't, don't test me. Don't, don't frustrate me. But testing biblically is an opportunity to prove yourself. So it's like taking a car on a test drive. You'd be unwise to go and buy a car without testing it out. You want to see how it performs, how it breaks, how it accelerates, you know, all the little bells and whistles that drive you crazy nowadays. You know, that your car just likes to yell at you nowadays with the technology we have. It beeps at you for every little thing, but you go on a test to see if that's what you want, to see if that's what will meet your needs. Tests reveal things. 
if you get a D minus on an exam, you either weren't fully prepared or you didn't understand the, the education. You didn't understand the lesson that was given to you. So in the same time though, even though testing reveals something to us, testing also has a reward and a blessing attached to it. James 1.2 says, consider it all joy whenever you face trials of many kind. For if you endure and you are steadfast, you will receive your blessing. You, if you remain, you will be steadfast. And when I looked that up, and actually uh, Jonathan had said this a few weeks ago and Thursday night, uh, this Greek word called hupomeni. He actually had us all say it. It was pretty funny when we were all trying to pronounce hupomeni. And what steadfast means, so if you, if you endure the testing, you consider it joy, you will become steadfast. And in the Greek, that word steadfast means that you have cheerful endurance. Cheerful endurance. You're not putting up with something. You actually have a joy and you become steadfast. Then in verse 12 of James 1 said, blessed is the man who remains steadfast because when they have endured to the end, they receive the crown of life. There is a blessing. So again, don't look at testing as a hardship. Consider it your opportunity for God's provision. The second thing and the, se the seven things that Abraham did, the, first, or the second here is he said, here I am. Here I am. That means availability. So the biggest hindrance, the biggest hindrance to God's provision, in my opinion, is that we fail to partner with him. When he calls us to obedience, when he calls us to something, we say, I can't do it. I'm not worthy enough. And we fail to partner with him. We're not available. And many times we're hesitant. We're hesitant to partner with God because we don't think we're worthy enough. We believe this lie that we are unworthy and that we're not qualified to be used by God. Now, God is not looking for perfection. He's looking for surrender. Another way I heard a preacher say is that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. It's the surrender. It's the willingness. It's the availability. And multiple times in those 14 verses, we see Abraham said, here I am, here I am, here I am. And what we have to understand is that our work is not found in our performance. It's found in what Jesus did for us. We are a child of God, period. So when God says, my child, I need you to do something, or here's what the word of the Lord is for your life, we can say, yes, Lord, I'm gonna partner with you regardless of what we have done because our identity is pure, righteous, upstanding. We are a child of God who can partner with him. Availability. The third thing Abraham did which many of us don't like doing, is that he got up early in the morning. Early in the morning. And what that says to me is immediate obedience. Immediate obedience. Now, I don't know about you, but if I heard the word of the Lord say, hey, you know, Gabriel, that kid you love so much, you're only begotten, that's actually his name in my phone, is Gabriel the only begotten, <laughs> is his contact name. But what if God said, hey, um, I need you to go take him and wrestle him and uh, kill him for me. Of all the things I hear from God as a preacher, that's probably gonna be the top thing where I get triple confirmation that I really heard from God. I'm gonna gather my pastor friends. I'm gonna see counsel. I'm gonna really, really, God, did I hear from you? I kind of need a burning bush experience right now. Did I hear from you? Of all the times that Abraham needed confirmation, it was that moment, but he didn't hesitate. So Abraham's immediate obedience teaches me two things. The first is that you really need to be confident in hearing God's voice. Are you proactively growing in your discipline of hearing God's voice? Are you hearing God and putting it to the test? Are you obeying God when he speaks to you? Are you confident that when you hear that voice, you're like, that is the father, that is God, no doubt, boom, I can jump on that and obey. Are you confident in God's voice? And the second, it shows how quickly we need to obey. Immediate obedience. And some scholars think that Abraham rose up real early in the morning, not just out of obedience, but so that Sarah would still be asleep. So that she wouldn't, in fear, try to convince him out of sacrificing their only son. So he kind of snuck out the back door, according to a couple of theologians. One preacher said, and, and I wrestled with this quote in my time of study, he said that delayed obedience is actually disobedience. Delayed obedience is actually disobedience. And I struggle with that for a little bit because I say, well, let's put it like this. 
Let's say one of you were called to be a pastor, but there was some fear. So it took you about a year before you actually signed up for seminary and started with the training that you thought, started really studying the word to preach. It took a year, but you did it. That's still obedience. Took you a little bit longer, right? But that's still obedience. So I'm like, how could delayed obedience be disobedience? Then I remembered I have a child and I'm a parent. And I remember when he was four and five years old and we're in a restaurant and he's bouncing off the walls, making noise, clanging stuff. I said, boy, be quiet. If it was immediate, he's obeying. Even if he takes five minutes, five seconds longer and it's still loud, that delayed obedience to me is disobedience. You're not hearing me. You know, <laughs> it's funny. And, and uh, there's oftentimes I'll say a lot of Hispanic sayings to Gabe in Spanish, you know, and, and one of them, uh, my parents used to say all the time when I was being the class clown, which I was, I mean, made me a preacher, didn't it? So, I mean, still, if, you're, if you got a kid who's a class clown, they can become preachers. That's all I'm saying. But my parents used to say this phrase to me in Spanish. It's te calmas o te calmo. And what that translates to is get calm or I'm going to make you calm. <laughs> Be quiet or I'm going to make you quiet. We need a little bit more of that nowadays. I'm just saying. All timeout is is a break. You grow up to be an adult and a timeout is a wonderful blessing. I'm just saying. Anyways. <laughs> so immediate obedience. Delayed obedience is just an opportunity for fear. I love Psalm 119 verse 60 in the New Living Translation says, I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. You know, and many know my style of leadership. I'm not your typical leader. I'm not your typical pastor uh, that, you know, likes the details and likes strategizing all the little things and has a thousand meetings. I'm a visionary. I like the big picture and I put people in place. I have nine staff members on my team around me. I, I put people in place and I empower them. This is your area. This is your baby. I trust you. I believe. Run, little chicky. Go, fly. Be free. And if you need coaching, I'm here. If I need to grab you by the collar, I will. But I'm not a micromanager. I'm, I'm not caught up in the details. And that's a cute way of saying I forget things all the time. <laughs> so I have wonderful people around me that remind me all the time. And not only do I make a list, not only do I put reminders in my phone, but over the last 10 years, I've done this discipline that works so well for me. And that's if you ask me to do something, nine times out of 10, I do it right then and there. And the reason I do that is because it will give me the opportunity to not have an opportunity to forget later. If I get it done right then and there, I don't have to remember it. I don't have to come back around to it. It's done and everybody's happy. And the same with the immediate obedience. If you obey God immediately, you're convinced of his voice, you obey right away, now you have no opportunity for doubt, for fear, or for a lack of faith. Jump on it right away. He's a good God, and if he spoke to you, go for it. Martin Luther said hundreds of years ago, he said that a true believer must crucify the question, why? That when God says it, I believe it. There's no why, God. There's no buts. There's no, you know, I heard, one sermon I heard years ago was your, your big butt's too big to get into heaven. No butts, no whys. Yes, Lord. Jump, how high? Number four, the phrase that I see a lot in scriptures, even with Jesus, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, was his phrase, raise his eyes. Abraham multiple times raised his eyes, which to me says, you got to have a proper perspective. If you want to see Jehovah Jireh move in your life, have a proper perspective. When we see the Israelites spying out the land of the promised land, isn't it amazing that these 10 spies come out, they come back, two are like, we got this, we can do this, God is with us. And the others are like, no, I mean, there are giants in the land. We seem like grasshoppers in their sight. The perspective was the enemy was bigger. And what was fascinating is that a few spies were able to convince 2.5 million people out of their promised land. Just a few men were able to convince an entire generation, two of which of the first generation would be the only ones in the promised land, to convince the entire first nation who would die in the wilderness out of their promised land because of a wrong perspective. Twice we see Abraham raise his eyes. Colossians 3.2 tells us, that we must fix our eyes on things above, 
not on things that are in the earth. The crazy thing is that bad news is not hard to find. You got to work to find some good news. Bad news is not hard to find. All you got to do is simply turn on the news and you're going to see bad news everywhere. You're going to see fear because fear sells. Fear captivates you. Fear is entertaining. You want to know more when you're in a place of fear. But as one, one of my former pastors told me, he goes, Rudy, before you get the morning news, you got to get the good news. Get that truth in your heart before you allow the world to ever get to a place to discourage you or to bring fear. You got to have the right perspective and live with a renewed mind. I heard one preacher say that really encouraged me. He said, when you get to that place of fear, when you're struggling with that discouragement, get into your prayer closet and keep praying until hope overflows in your heart. Hope deferred makes one sick. So if we're in a place of fear, of doubt, of worry, of questions, of confusion, get into your prayer closet. Read the Psalms until you can hear your voice in it. Pray until hope rises up in your heart because we got to have the right perspective. Number five, he says, we will return to you. We will go worship and then we will come back. Notice the confident faith that Abraham had when he's like, hey guys, hang out here. I'm going to go sacrifice my son, but we're going to come back to you, the both of us. And in Hebrews 11:9, 9, it says, Abraham considered that God is able, that he can even raise the dead in people. So I think Abraham had this notion that I'm going to obey God, period, and I'm going to obey quickly. But even if my son were to die, God is so good and so faithful, he can even raise him up from the dead, and my promise will continue. Abe had this confidence in faith in the promise of God. And so if we don't have a confidence in God's promise, we're going to have a confidence in the problem. That's just the bottom line. If we're not convinced of his truth, it's going to be that easier to get convinced of the lie. We have to have a confident faith. And faith in the Greek is the word pisces, which means a conviction of truth, which means you believe the truth so much that in all your actions, you won't be wavered by fear or disbelief or any other confusion. You are convinced of it. You got to believe that even if you can't see where God is taking you or see what he's doing, he's going to be faithful to his promise. Heard a pastor who uh, wanted to do a, a food drive for a specific cause in his community. And instead of, you know, getting shelf stable things like canned green beans and canned corn, you know, he says, I want something better that can last on a shelf for a while. So let's do a cereal drive, a breakfast cereal drive. So people started bringing you know, uh, their favorite cereals and a truck pulled up and had 197 boxes of cereal. Every kind, Lucky Charms, you know, uh, Cocoa Crisp, all the kind that you love that we shouldn't eat. They're all there. And the team at the church, they went up to the pastor and said, what are we gonna do with all these boxes? We're a little community, a small town. There's no way we can use all these boxes. They're gonna go bad and they're going to go to a waste. And the pastor's like, no, God knows what he's doing. So a week later, a local principal calls a pastor and says, hey, we have a great lunch program for our kids, but there are so many at-risk kids at our, our school that the majority of them come to school not having eaten anything. Is there any way your church can provide some type of breakfast items? And the pastor goes, well, I think I know someone who has 197 boxes of cereal. <laughs> So God has a plan, and we have to trust that plan with confident faith. Number six, and I'm almost done here. Number six, we hear the famous saying of Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. That was a declaration. That's what he declared, that you are God, my provider. He declared it, and he even named the city after that. So when we are waiting on God for whatever provision you need, a restoration in your family, a miracle in your finances, a miracle in your health, a clarity in, in some type of decision you need to make. When you're waiting on the provision, the most important thing that we can do is to prepare our hearts and be ready for what God will say and what God will do. And declarations are one of the most powerful ways that we can keep our hearts connected to God. Declaring out loud, God, you are good. God, you know you have a way. God, this is no surprise to you. You declare out loud and welcome the power of God in your life. Because the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that words 
our houses. So if God inhabits the praise of his people, we're housing the very word of God. We're, we're housing it. And so if God inhabits the praises of his people, who inhabits the complaints of his people? Our words are powerful. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and we must declare the good things of God. Like Philippians 4.19 that says, my God shall supply all your needs in Jesus Christ. He will supply all your needs, your needs. But just remember that there's a big difference between needs and wants. Sometimes we get that confused. You know, you, you want Starbucks. You don't need Starbucks, especially when it's $7 for a latte, right? <laughs> needs and wants are different. We see in, in Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But when you dig into that word want in the Hebrew, it's actually better translated as you will not lack. You will not lack. So that means a need. That means God will always take care of your needs. One preacher said, God will always bring to you a need, but the things that you want in your authority, you got to go get. There's a, there's a difference between needs and want. And in Psalm 34, 10, it says, lions grow hungry and weak, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. We got to declare these things. Build a, a, a resume of, of God's goodness and, and who he is. Build a declaration list of what he truly is and what he will do for you. We got to declare. We got to put our words to our faith and declare it out loud. And finally, the seventh thing that Abraham did before the provision of the Lord was that he built. We don't do good works for salvation. We do good works because of salvation. The Bible says that we need to praise our Father. We need to declare these good works so that people can see our good works so that they can praise the Father that is in heaven. Good works are good when they're done through grace. So when you're in the waiting seasons of life, you need to serve. You need to be an expression of God's love and his power. And I've said this example all the time that waiting on the Lord is not waiting around doing nothing. It's like a waiter at a restaurant who's asking you questions. What do you need? Do you need a refill? Is everything okay? Can I help? They're, they're constantly serving. So I personally, I've changed a phrase in my own life. I'm no longer waiting on the Lord. I'm watching for the Lord. In the middle of what I'm expecting God to do, I'm not just going to wait around. I'm not going to just stay busy. I'm going to be watching, watching what God is going to do. I'm going to be waiting on him. And I've had a lot of opportunities to do this. I'll conclude just with this quick little encouragement. I've had plenty of opportunities to be in the middle and waiting for God's provision. Many of you know my testimony of only having $20 left in my bank account. You know that we've been homeless for three months. You know, we've moved 29 times in 18 years. We've been through some stuff. But as many of the trials that I've seen, I've seen an equal or more amounts of testimony. And there's something about the testimony that just outweighs the perspective of the trial. I know of a church that they hired a full-time historian, not for the history of the church, for the history of the miracles in the church. So they have a full-time person to record and categorize all of the testimonies that happen in their church. So that way, if you're struggling in any area in your faith, you can go onto their website, click whatever title it is, and you can see person after person after person who's gone through the same thing that you did, and they stand upon those testimonies to build up a resilience and an encouragement to not give up, but to keep watching and looking for God. We need to build a list of testimonies. It's my encouragement to you, build a list of testimonies in your life. Remind yourself of why you can trust God. Remind yourself when you're not seeing the provision that he's working in the waiting, and you're gonna win in the waiting. And finally, I know I'm such a preacher this morning. I said, finally, like five times already. But I'm wrapping up the sermon and I'm reviewing it this morning at my desk. Uh, family goes off. Gabriel goes to the sound and Nikki goes up to get ready for worship practice. And me and my little puppy, we're sitting in the office and, and I'm just wrapping up reviewing one more time before I head over to the church. And it dawned on me today, as I looked over, I'm in my office at the house and my little one and a half year old schnauzer is asleep on her bed. She has her own bed in my office. She has a bed in the living room. She sleeps in our bed, but she has her own bed in my office. And it dawned on me for the very first time, I dreamed about this day. 
I dreamed about having a home that all my son's friends wanted to come to. I dreamed of a day when I can sit in an office to prepare the word of God for the people, to be in a place where God has provided for us. I even dreamed I would love to sit at my office and have a little, little doggy right next to me. And I looked over and I thought, I never prayed for this. I never specifically looked to God and said, God, one day I would love my own home office in a place where a dog would be comfortable just to sleep and watch me work. But I dreamed it. And isn't it awesome? Our God, Jehovah Jireh, the provider. He's not only a faithful God to his own promises. He's not only a God who will fulfill our needs and our wants, but he's a God who will even partner with the dreams you have in your hearts because he loves us and because he's good. So let me just encourage you today in the smallest things to the biggest things. Let's trust that God knows what he's doing and he's a good God who is faithful to his promise. So Father, we just praise you today and thank you for being that, for being such an amazing and a good God, for being so loving towards us, for loving us before we had a chance to love you. And Lord, as we are discovering more about you, that you really are almighty. You really are our healer. And you are the one who provides. Regardless of our circumstances, we thank you that you are faithful to your name, faithful to your word, faithful to your promise. May you resurrect hope in the hearts of my friends here today. May you renew a steadfast spirit within us. May you bring us back to the joy of our salvation. And Holy Spirit, may you speak revelation to our hearts. Bless my friends today from the top of the head to the bottom of their feet as they leave this place today, that they will go in your peace, go in your joy, and go in your power. For my friends who are watching online, may they feel and encounter your presence in the very place that they are watching. Lord, we love you and we praise you today. We ask now that you go before us, that all that we say and that we do would be honoring to your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, family. There'll be some awesome people who would love to pray for you if you're in need of prayer. Otherwise, have a wonderful, wonderful day.